Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Captain Fred Passman. I'm the uh, commander of the Naval Order of the United States Continental Commandery. I welcome you to this evening's presentation. Before I introduce this evening's speaker, just want to remind everybody that the Naval Order's mission is to preserve, promote, and celebrate and enjoy our nation's sea service history. And we do that through programs like our virtual Naval History Lecture Series, um, as well as uh, for many of the commanderies, live meetings, um, participation in events in various localities around the nation. Um, if you're interested in learning more, I uh, suggest you visit our website. And if Mark, you could bring on the banner of the uh, Continental Commandery's website. You can get more information about uh, our commandery, the Naval Order, and how you can join the organization. Now, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, this evening's uh, guest speaker. And uh, Christopher uh, Blaker, although he's going to be talking about aircraft carriers on the Great Lakes, his connection is with the Marine Corps University in, in Quatico. Um, Chris uh, works for the Department of the Navy as an editor of scholarly books and journals at the Marine Corps University Press. Again, that's located in, in beautiful Quantico, Virginia. Um, he's an American historian who specializes primarily in Naval and Marine Corps activities during World War II um, and in the Great Lakes region. So uh, there's more. You can get the full uh, biography, visiting uh, the right now the upcoming events page on the commandery's uh, website. But I don't want to take away from Chris's time. So Chris, welcome this evening. Um, you've got a fascinating subject as a former Corn Belt Fleet sailor. Um, the of course the carriers were long gone by the time I was a. Uh, an E-1 striking for a quartermaster and, and riding uh, some of the DDEs and PCEs that were home-based around the Great Lakes. Um, but uh, when I heard about this, uh, I was utterly fascinated that, that we had people doing their carrier quals in the middle of Lake Michigan. So um, how did you come upon this, this, this story? Um... Gosh, I'm, I'm thinking back to when that would have started. Um, I was looking for a new project uh, that would allow me to focus on, on Navy and Marine Corps activities in the Great Lakes and stumbled upon these two carriers. Um, actually, when I was doing research on my grandfather who served aboard a carrier in World War II, and I, and I saw these two carriers with, uh, with IX instead of CV or CVL. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, sort of just popped off in my brain, like, you know, what, what the heck is this? And it, the project just rolled from there. That, that's amazing. So, so without uh, cutting into your formal presentation time, we'll visit again once you've uh, shared some of your insights with us. Um, before I turn the uh, floor over to you completely, I want to remind everybody that if you have questions while Chris is uh, about anything Chris says or about carriers on Great Lakes during World War II, uh, I invite you to post them in the comments box as you watch the presentation. And we'll be going through your questions after Chris has uh, completed his formal part of his presentation. We'll have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So without further ado, Chris, it's all yours. All right. Thanks so much, Fred. I really appreciate that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, before I kick things off, I, I just want to thank the Naval Order for having me out tonight, uh, and especially all those who have had a hand in organizing and preparing this event, uh, including Fred, John, Mark, and, and anyone else that I may be forgetting here. Apologies if I've missed you. Um, I'm really excited uh, to be here tonight to talk a little bit about the USS Wolverine and Sable. Uh, these were two training aircraft carriers that operated on the Great Lakes during World War II. Um, as Fred mentioned, I work for the Navy Department over at Marine Corps University in Quantico, 
And I'm originally from Michigan. I grew up just outside Detroit, uh, where I spent a lot of my life out on the Great Lakes. And so you can see how this sort of project is the perfect passion project for me, uh, being able to combine my, my love for naval history with my own history as a, as a Great Lakes native. Um, before I jump into the, the full presentation itself, I, I would like to comment that Naval Carrier Aviation, as many of us know, is celebrating its centennial this year. Uh, it's been 100 years since the conversion and commissioning of, or recommissioning, excuse me, of the Navy's first aircraft carrier, USS Langley, in 1922. Uh, and so I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to help commemorate such an important centennial in my own small way. Uh, Naval Carrier Aviation has always had a very special place in my heart, uh, especially during the World War II era, in that my own grandfather served aboard the USS Hornet CV-8 as a member of the Carrier's Marine Detachment in 1942. Uh, he saw combat at the Battle of Midway through the early Guadalcanal campaign uh, and at the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, uh, where the Hornet was lost in action and its Marine Detachment suffered uh, nearly 50% casualties. Uh, fortunately, my granddad survived the battle and he went on to serve as uh, one of Admiral William F. Halsey's Marine orderlies in the South Pacific in uh, 43 and 44, and then subsequently during the great cruises of the Third Fleet in 44 and 45. Now, this took him directly to Tokyo Bay, where he was present for the Japanese surrender on board the USS Missouri uh, with Admiral Halsey. So learning about his story, uh, and especially his time on the Hornet, uh, was one of the biggest reasons I always wanted to work for the Navy Department all my life. Now, the reason I share this preface is simply to express my, my deep connection to and respect for uh, the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, the, the Naval Services, the Naval, the Naval Team. This family history, this, this Naval heritage that I'm lucky enough to have is something of which I'm very proud. And I know that Everyone tuning in here tonight has some kind of connection to that too, whether it be service, uh, past or current or even future, or a family legacy, or simply uh, a burning interest in this subject. And so it's, uh, it's really nice to be here among friends tonight. So let's get cracking with uh, the presentation. Throughout the early 20th century, scores of Americans sailed the Great Lakes on luxury excursion steamships that were built for speed, comfort, and extravagance. While all those ships provided uh, passengers pleasant voyages between freshwater ports, two of their number went on to serve an even higher purpose as the United States' only freshwater aircraft carriers during World War II. Now, I'll begin with a, a little background before we really jump into things. Uh, World War II has been described by naval historian Samuel Elliott Morrison as the greatest of all naval wars, during which the U.S. Navy fought simultaneously in both the Atlantic and Pacific, battling the navies of Germany, Italy, and Japan on numerous fronts and theaters throughout the world. Between December 7, 1941, when the Imperial Japanese Navy attacked the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, and brought the United States into the war, and August 15, 1945, when Japan announced its surrender to the United States and its allies, the U.S. Navy swelled from fewer than 800 ships to more than 6,700. Now, of those vessels, 110 were aircraft carrier types, uh, each of which bore anywhere between 20 and 105 planes. As carrier warfare swiftly came of age in World War II, the Navy's flat-top fleet grew rapidly. Uh, just eight carriers had been commissioned before December of 41, while the remaining 102 joined the fleet during the next four years. Now, the vast expansion of the Navy's carrier fleet meant that its air arm, including planes and especially pilots, had to keep up. Indeed, it was naval aviation that had one of the biggest hands in winning World War II at sea, and a great many courageous, plucky American flyers fought on the front lines of more than 65 major battles and campaigns in the Atlantic and Pacific theaters of war. Those training in the United States to become carrier pilots which you know, were among the most glamorous and dangerous jobs in an already remarkably glamorous and dangerous profession, were first required to qualify by performing a series of successful carrier takeoffs and landings aboard a training vessel before they could be assigned to an air group aboard an active duty carrier. To keep these carrier pilots to be far from any combat area during their training, most were sent to the Great Lakes to learn the ropes aboard the freshwater training carriers USS Wolverine, IX-64, 
and USS Sable, IX-81. Some 35,000 aviators qualified as carrier pilots aboard these two freshwater vessels during the war, securing noble positions for both ships in the vast annals of military history. But there's even more to their stories than their service in World War II. Interestingly, Wolverine and Sable had been sailing the inland lakes long before any of the Navy's combat carriers were even built. Born from the vision of a renowned Michigan naval architect and made famous throughout the state and beyond as C&B and Greater Buffalo, two luxury sidewheel excursion steamers on the Great Lakes. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, in the early 20th century, the Great Lakes region was home to numerous sidewheel paddle steamships that sailed the inland waters built for both comfort and extravagance and offering passengers luxury overnight service between such freshwater ports as Detroit, Michigan, Cleveland, Ohio, Buffalo, New York, and Chicago, Illinois. Many were designed by a naval architect named Frank E. Kirby from the Detroit area, a marine engineer who specialized in paddle wheel steamers and was responsible for the design of such famous ships as Tashmu in 1899, Columbia in 1902, St. Clair in 1910, City of Detroit 3 in 1911, and Greater Detroit in 1924. In 1913, the steel-hulled, coal-driven sidewheel excursion steamer C&B began service with the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company on Lake Erie. Designed by Kirby and constructed by the Detroit Shipbuilding Company at Wyandotte, Michigan, the vessel's name was actually derived from the sound of that of its owning company, C and B for Cleveland and Buffalo. Boasting a length of 500 feet, five decks, and a total measurement of more than 6,300 registered tons, CNB was at that time the largest sidewheel passenger steamer to sail on inland waterways anywhere in the world. It was propelled by an inclined compound steam engine and nine coal-fired scotch boilers, which allowed it to reach speeds of more than 19 knots and made it one of the fastest steamers on the Great Lakes. Twelve years later, in 1925, the sidewheel paddle steamer Greater Buffalo joined CNB on Lake Erie, sailing between Detroit and Buffalo. Designed, too, by Kirby, the new steel-hulled, coal-driven steamship was constructed by the American Shipbuilding Company at Lorraine, Ohio, and first entered service with the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company. Spanning 518 feet in length and measuring more than 7,700 gross register tons, the seven-deck Greater Buffalo was even larger and heavier than CNB. Like its predecessor, it was powered by an inclined compound steam engine and nine coal-fired boilers, helping it reach 18 knots on the inland lakes. Now, both of these ships were designed to offer travelers grand luxury during overnight voyages. CNB and Greater Buffalo's many decks boasted dazzling spaces for dining and socializing, including regal banquet rooms, vast saloons, lounges filled with padded furniture, and hundreds of staterooms, all of which had telephones, and the most expensive of which included private baths and balconies. Passengers aboard ship could enjoy fine dining throughout the day, dance to the dynamic music of live orchestras in the evening, and sip cocktails on deck, though, of course, national prohibition put a pause on that particular activity in the 20s and early 30s. CNB and Greater Buffalo sailed the Great Lakes together for nearly 20 years, ferrying a myriad of travelers from port to port during the height of luxury passenger steamer service on the inland lakes. CNB traveled mostly between uh, Cleveland and Buffalo with occasional cruises to other ports such as Detroit or Chicago, while Greater Buffalo maintained its route between Detroit and Buffalo. Both vessels felt the impact of the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, between 1930 and 1935, and then again in 38. Greater Buffalo was temporarily removed for, uh, from service due to economic concerns on the part of the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company. And after the Cleveland and Buffalo Transit Company went bankrupt in 1939, CNB was purchased by the CNB Transit Company in Chicago, a different company, to continue operating on the Great Lakes. So, by the end of 1941, World War II had been raging across the globe for more than two years, though the United States had thus far managed to remain officially neutral. That, as we know, all changed on December 7th, when the Imperial Japanese Navy launched a surprise raid on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor and began a vast, violent campaign of conquest across Southeast Asia. 
The United States declared war on Japan the following day, and three days later, Japan's allies, Germany and Italy, declared war on the United States, plunging the United States into a two-ocean war with less than a one-ocean navy. Much of World War II at sea, especially in the Pacific theater, was dominated by contests of air power, with aircraft carriers serving as a fleet's primary workhorses during many naval operations and engagements. Upon the outbreak of war, the U.S. Navy had just seven fleet carriers at its disposal. Uh, by July of 42, two of those had been sunk by enemy action, and by November, two more joined those on the ocean floor. If the United States was to win the war at sea, it needed to deploy dozens more carriers, as well as thousands of new pilots, to fly from their decks. To construct the carriers, the Navy turned to shipyards across the continental United States. To train the pilots, it turned to the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes region was chosen to serve as home to the Navy's carrier qualification training program during the war for several important reasons, chief among them being that the Navy required a body of water that was both large enough to hold one or several training carriers and also far enough away from the front lines on either coast to ensure their safety while sailing unescorted. Lake Michigan, located hundreds of miles from either coast, and spanning more than 22,000 square miles with an average depth of nearly 300 feet would certainly do the trick. And as for the training carriers, those non-combatant vessels on which young pilots would qualify as carrier aviators, where were they to come from? There were already so few carriers then serving with the U.S. fleet, so none could be spared from combat duty. There were, however, a great many steamships that had been cruising the Great Lakes for decades, and it would certainly be much, fa excuse me, much faster and cheaper to convert one or more of those into temporary training carriers, then construct entirely new vessels from the keel up. And so, the Navy turned to the luxury side-wheel paddle steamers of the Great Lakes, freshwater vessels with home ports in Michigan, New York, Ohio, and Illinois, to train their carrier pilots who would help bring about the destruction of the Axis navies. On March 12, 1942, CNB was acquired from the CNB Transit Company, for $756,500 to become the United States' first inland training carrier. The excursion vessel was designated an unclassified miscellaneous auxiliary, IX-64, and underwent a $1.9 million conversion job in Buffalo during the summer of 1942, when the Navy was slogging it out with the Japanese in the Coral Sea and at Midway and with the Germans in the Atlantic. The conversion process included stripping the steamer's large wooden superstructure and top decks and building a 550-foot-long, 98-foot-wide oak plank flight deck in their place. On August 2nd, CNV was renamed Wolverine, chosen for the mammal that served as the state of Michigan's unofficial mascot. Ten days later, it was commissioned with Commander George R. Fair, uh, Fairland in command. Wolverine arrived in Lake Michigan before the end of that month, described by one Chicago newspaper as looking like, and I quote, an outsized oblong pancake to begin conducting carrier training operations. On August 2nd, or excuse me, on August 7th, 1942, as U.S. Marines stormed ashore the island of Guadalcanal in the South Pacific and Wolverine neared its commissioning in Buffalo, the Navy acquired Greater Buffalo from the Detroit and Cleveland Navigation Company for approximately $1 million to become the nation's second inland training aircraft carrier. Similarly to its predecessor, Greater Buffalo was designated an unclassified miscellaneous auxiliary, IX-81, and received a new name, Sable, on September 19th. Following a $2.9 million conversion at the Erie plant of the American Shipbuilding Company in Buffalo, during which a new 518-foot-long, 58-foot-wide metal flight deck was completed, the new warship was commissioned on May 8, 1943, with Captain Warren K. Burner in command. Within three weeks, Sable had joined Wolverine on Lake Michigan and was conducting flight operations from its deck. As the Navy's only coal-burning, steam-driven, side-wheel aircraft carriers, both unarmored and unarmed, Wolverine and Sable served the vitally important mission of training tens of thousands of Navy and Marine Corps pilots in basic carrier operations on the Great Lakes. The ships were docked at Navy Pier in Chicago, located near Naval Station Great Lakes, 
in the Navy's Carrier Qualification Training Unit at Glenview Naval Air Station. Now, to qualify as a carrier aviator, each pilot had to successfully take off and land aboard either carrier eight to ten times. Only then could he be shipped out to join a combat squadron of the U.S. fleet. Both Wolverine and Sable quickly proved to be excellent training platforms for carrier operations in all theaters of war. Their flight decks were large enough to handle the same types of aircraft that were then being flown in combat, such as Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters, Douglas SBD Dauntless dive bombers, and Grumman TBF Avenger torpedo bombers, which allowed pilots to train in the very planes they'd later be flying in battle. But their decks were still shorter than most U.S. carriers then in combat, which meant that if a pilot could fly from the Wolverine or Sable, he could certainly fly from any flat top in the fleet. Shipbuilding Supervisor Lieutenant Commander Edward A. Eisel, USN, noted, and I quote, with a ship this size, pilots will be trained to land their planes on a handkerchief. Though there were several notable limitations aboard the freshwater carriers when compared to their combat carrier counterparts, such as low cruising speeds that didn't produce very much wind over the deck for takeoffs or landings, uh, a lack of elevators, hangars, catapults, and maintenance facilities, and only so much space on the flight deck for parked planes, the two Great Lakes trainers did a fine job of preparing naval aviators to fly from combat carriers. Between August of 1942 and November of 1945, when Wolverine and Sable were operating on Lake Michigan, approximately 35,000 pilots qualified as carrier aviators. For most, their time in the Great Lakes region was a chapter in their lives that would never be forgotten, but this was not always for a good reason. See, during their training flights, the pilots were required to fly with their cockpits open in case they crash landed in the water and had to escape the sinking plane. This made for particularly frigid flights, uh, especially during the region's unforgiving winter months. One of those pilots in training was none other than future U.S. President George H.W. Bush, who qualified aboard Sable in August of 1943 as a 19-year-old Navy Lieutenant Junior Grade. Bush, a native of New England, later recalled, I remember those Great Lakes flights very well in the open cockpit, coldest I ever was in my life. Ultimately, the practice of training so many pilots in such a short frame of time meant that there were inevitable mishaps that resulted in loss of aircraft, loss of life, or both. More than 200 accidents occurred in the Great Lakes during World War II, which included more than 120 planes crashing or ditching into the water and the deaths of eight pilots. Many damaged aircraft that were retrieved from shallow waters could fortunately be repaired in Chicago, and several planes that had been lost in the deep or even later recovered as well. Interestingly, because of Lake Michigan's low temperatures, U.S. Navy historians note that the aircraft assemblage there represents the largest and best preserved group of U.S. Navy sunken historic aircraft in the world. Wolverine and Sable performed their important function for the remainder of World War II remaining in the Great Lakes to qualify carrier pilots even after Germany and Japan surrendered, respectively, to the United States and its allies on May 8th and September 2nd of 1945. And I'll note, uh, as an interesting aside, in addition to training carrier pilots, Sable actually uh, also conducted flight tests with experimental unmanned drones in West Grand Traverse Bay off Traverse City, Michigan in, uh, in mid 1943. Both vessels were awarded the American Campaign Medal and World War II Victory Medal for their wartime service. Having contributed mightily to the many victories of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps in the Two Ocean War, the two training carriers were officially decommissioned from the Navy on November 7, 1945, and sold for scrapping in 47-48. Initially meant to perform a civilian job on the Great Lakes as C&B and Greater Buffalo, and performing that job splendidly for decades, Wolverine and Sable did much to help guarantee victory for the United States and its allies in World War II. Though they themselves never saw battle in the Atlantic or Pacific, they prepared tens of thousands of naval aviators who did. In the end, the history of these two freshwater flat tops is vastly significant to that of both the U.S. military and the American home front, to the Great Lakes region and its many ports, and to my home state of Michigan, 
which sent more than 610,000 of its sons and daughters to serve in uniform in World War II, some of whom even had the privilege to fly from the decks of Wolverine and Sable near the shores of their home state. Um, I realize I, I kind of whipped through this rather quickly. Uh, <laughs> apologies for that, but uh, I want to thank you all again for having me out here tonight and, uh, and for tuning into this lecture. Uh, it looks like we've got a lot of time left, so I'm, I'm happy to use that remaining time to, to answer any questions as best I can or to hear any thoughts or comments and to, uh, to get a conversation going. So thank you very much. That was terrific. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. No, I'm, I'm trying to, um, my screen shows this StreamYard with the duck saying live viewer comments show up on StreamYard. Am I the only one seeing that or are you seeing that too? I'm seeing that as well. Yeah, I, I don't know how to get rid of that. Um, let's see, great presentation. What was the tactical diameter? You know, okay, so we've got ships steaming Great Lakes and uh, although, they seem to be expansive when you're cruising them. Um, you look at a map, and they don't seem to be all that big. What was their tactical diameter? How, how you know, many uh, yards did it take for either of these two ships to make a turn? And then you, I had to think that with the side paddle propulsion system, it was pretty. It was pretty broad. Yes, that's I. That's my guess. Um, I don't have. Uh, that statistic uh, available, but it's certainly something I can look into because, you know, John makes a great point um, with this sort of uh, antiquated or at the very least uh, secondary propulsion system, right? You're going to have a very wide radius there, um, which makes me wonder uh, for the purpose of recovering pilots, right? They, they might have been sitting out there for a minute uh, until they were able to be picked up with a, with a radius that wide. Right. Now, did the pilots spend any time actually living aboard uh, the uh, ships or were they flying out to the ships from Glenview, doing their, you know, touch and go and then returning to Glenview when it was time to, you know, wrap up the day? From what I have read and from what I understand, a lot of them were living, at least for those very short cruises, uh, aboard the ship. and and. Of course, the ship had its own crew as well, its own its own complement uh, to make sure that that it was up kept and sailing well. But in order to both uh, fly from the deck and to return to the deck, uh, the pilots would be out there. Now, I can't imagine these these, and I, I even have to put up air quotes. Cruises were very long, right? Because uh, without hangars or elevators or anything of that kind, you can only get so many planes on that deck. Um, and I assume that once the uh, once the full complement of pilots uh, had finished their quals, they probably just turned around and went back to port. Right. And uh, my question about birthing: I'm looking at you know the original luxury steamers, and I'm guessing most of the birthing was above the main deck, and maybe you had a limited amount of birthing for a ship's company mm -hmm. below the main deck. And presumably after the conversion, that was what there was for birthing for ship's company and um, embarked pilots. Yes, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you're losing all of those, those above deck uh, staterooms, right? And so what you're left with um, under, under the big barn door is, is really all you've got to work with for your crew. <laughs> um, Last month, we heard about the Doolittle Raid, and, and obviously the whole concept, there were a couple of people who really uh, deserve most of the credit for saying, we can do this, uh, we can find the aircraft that uh, can carry the bombs the distance and launch off of uh, the existing carrier decks. Um, was there any individual or, or small team of individuals say, hey, you know, we need to train pilots let's convert um, luxury liners that are already on the Great Lakes to carriers. Any names pop up? The names, sure? yeah, the names do not pop up. Um, and that's not because that information is not available. It's simply because I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> but I know that um, the training units outside of uh, Chicago and Detroit and a lot of those um, 
what would be, I guess, the uh, the inland naval districts were the ones who were putting forth the ideas, saying, "We know these we, we know these ships are out there. Um, what do you think about doing a conversion here?" Um, because at this point, you know, early to mid nineteen forty two, getting into to late 1942 and very early 43, we still did not have a lot of carriers. And so anything that we built from the keel up for the purpose of training would have taken away a big chunk of combat power from the fleet. I mean, even even the littlest one, Ranger, was out in the Atlantic uh, doing right. quite a lot of good. And I think that would have probably been the one that they pulled for training purposes if if that was possible. But this seemed like just the the perfect way of using something they already had and and being able to keep those combat carriers out at sea. Now how it's you know the numbers of, of pilots you mentioned something like thirty five thousand pilots mm -hmm. uh, earn their carrier quals. Uh, how much time from reporting to Glenview and and I'm assuming that Glenview had a carrier deck, you know um, dotted line on one or more of the runways at Glenview and full disclosure, I've, I've spent a moderate amount of time at Glenview um, during my 10 years in, in Chicago. Uh, so what was the timeline for a pilot to spend getting carrier qual before and shipping out? Do you have a sense? Was it I, three, four weeks? Was it a matter of three, four days? You can do I think, 10 landings quickly. Right, right. I and I think that's what it depended on. I think it depended on however many uh, pilots you were with and whether or not uh, weather was good and just as how many times you can get into the air and back down onto the deck. Um, I can't imagine that aviators would have been there uh, very long, probably a couple of weeks at the very, very most um, before shipping out and then starting to train with your combat unit, right, as, as a fresh ensign. Right. So a um, number of questions from John, all great questions. Uh, you showed, I don't think you actually showed the picture of the two ships. I showed it in one of the um, come here, the lecture uh, blurbs where you've got the ships side by side at Navy Pier, um, moored stern to the pier. Um, logistically, where did the ships take on call and how long could they operate between replenishments? I believe that was all done at uh, Navy Pier or in the facilities around Navy Pier because Chicago, of course, had been one of the, the prime ports for these uh, these paddle wheel steamers for decades at this point. Right, okay. And, and I can't imagine that the other steamers were not still sailing on the Great Lakes, right? So these facilities were were continuing to operate and so to the best of my knowledge, it was sort of business as usual. I'm sure that the two carriers uh, were able to take precedence over the other steamers. But it, it sounds to me like all these facilities were already in place and simply allowed to continue probably uh, with a higher priority. So when they took on call, was that a, a stevedore job out of Chicago, do you know? Or was it like an old hands evolution as it would have been with... Uh, coal fire ships of the of that era i actually don't know the answer to that um yeah, we're I giving know... you plenty of things to come back with uh, after you know you get to do a lot of uh, a little dis research about yeah i have some digging to do to think <laughs> about. Um, uh, let's see any particular reason oh there was here's one from uh um michael golden were there any espionage concerns out in the Great Lakes? Um, yes, but I would say that um, to a lesser degree than anything training out of either coast. Um, we think of the, uh, uh, what would it have been? The USS Wyoming, I think, perhaps. Uh, the old, the ex-battleship that was being used as a uh, gunnery training ship mm -hmm. out, uh, out on the Atlantic coast. And I think that was something that was certainly more worrisome. Um, I think that the Navy and to an extension, the, the Marine Corps and Coast Guard team viewed the Great Lakes as a wonderful place uh, to conduct things that they wanted to keep particularly secret, such as those uh, experimental drone takeoffs and landings that right. I mentioned. 
Now, Lake Michigan is completely surrounded by American territory, so you don't even have that international border to worry about. Um, of course, Canada was an ally, which made things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. But I think I think it was viewed by the Navy as being a very safe place to conduct these sort of operations. And and before I come back to talking about the carriers, when you mentioned in passing, you know, due to prohibition, uh, the cocktail parties were uh, kind of kibashed. Um, at least Lake Erie and um, Lake Superior isn't half the aren't half of each of those lakes in Canadian territory. Yeah, and they sure are. Could, couldn't the ships kind of like we can only serve when we're north of the uh, parallel? <laughs> you know, I never thought about that, but I don't. I mean, why not? Right? It's why uh, not. Um, one deck was steel. One deck was oak. Was there a reason for that other than just materials on hand when the evolution took place that's that's my guess um i can't i can't say for sure but my assumption is that i'm looking right now with the dates so wolverine was converted um between march of 42 and was commissioned uh in august of 42 that's very very early in the war and so i can't imagine that there was any steel to spare um, later, obviously, the sable is being acquired in August of '42 and didn't uh, didn't reach its commissioning until May of '43, uh, when the the shipbuilding was kind of really hitting its stride. And I think that uh, steel was probably more readily accessible, more available. And it's possible too that even the you know the Wolverine being out there on Lake Michigan, uh, you know maybe uh, maybe the people in charge of the program felt that if we can get a steel deck, let's do it. It'd be better. It'd be an improvement. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, looking for in the comments section, let's see, were there any, we already asked the question about the single individual uh, or individual organizations that pursue the concept. We asked the question about the espionage. Let me go back over here to our private chat. So, you know, my experience living on Lake Michigan is that um, even in the late 80s, there were times of year where the ice coverage went fairly far out on the lakes. Um, were there periods when the carriers could not operate because of the risk of, of ice flows in the lake? Yes, absolutely. Um, some of those very brutal winters, uh, these carriers found themselves laid up um, for how long, I'm not I'm not sure, but I know that uh, I would not be surprised if you looked at the number of pilots qualifying aboard these two ships and seeing most of them coming out between, gosh, when is it nice in Michigan? Three months a year. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's more, yeah, more in the spring. May to summer. October, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I would not be surprised to see that. And I'm sure that's when they got the bulk of their quals done was during those months. Because, yeah, I mean, and, and Lake Michigan is notoriously, those, those can be very, very rough waters. Um, and so it's fortunate that these steamships were developed by a Great Lakes maritime architect and, and a maritime engineer who understood uh, the ways in which that these ships would need to be built in order to navigate those waters safely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, the tremendous amount of uh, iron ore and, and coal transported across those lakes and and the number of collier type ships that you know went to the bottom not right. only the edmund fist general but uh <laughs> plenty more plenty more plenty more was was um uh you could get even in fairly decent weather you could get some good chop uh, back when i was a commanding officer of a naval uh, uh control shipping unit uh, out of uh, great lakes we would collaborate with the uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary and do, uh, you know, convoy steaming or convoy motoring okay. out of uh, the Chicago Yacht Club. And you get some pretty good seas, even on a fine summer's day. Um, let's see. I've got another new comment coming in. And the question is, was there a plane guard available to rescue crashed in? Okay, so as you may know, typically there's a destroyer that follows 500 yards uh, astern of carriers 
during flight ops. Um, was there a similar sort of operational uh, patrol working in, in uh, concert with the carriers when they were doing their flight operations? There were, yes. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of watercraft were used um, and whether or not they were operated by the Navy, uh, the Coast Guard, or civilians, but uh, usually they would come out of Chicago with the carrier and that would be their job. I also know that the carriers relied on uh, smaller planes too, kind of a, a combat air patrol is such a horrible way of putting it, but some, right, something... Right a smaller plane up there, um, maybe a, a duck or a, a kingfisher or something uh, mm -hmm. would be up patrolling to uh, to also help with that. Okay. Um, so were the, would these uh, planes have pontoons so that they could do uh, water landings? Yes, and, they could, and, yeah, and taxi landing. in the waterfront. Yes. Yeah, they'd okay. usually use float planes. And that's, and that's why I'm curious, because I don't know whether it, those were flown by the Navy or the Coast Guard. I know the Coast Guard operated a lot of smaller float planes for search and rescue right. duty um, off the coasts. And so I imagine that it would, it could have been them. Uh, it could have been them, excuse me, but the Navy uh, had the planes for that purpose as well. Okay. I also understand there were, there were two iterations of the Corn Belt fleet, one that operated between the wars. And then the one, um, when I did my first uh, post boot camp cruise is when the USS Ely uh, named after one of the earliest carrier pilots. Um, and that was a patrol craft escort home ported in Sheboygan. So I believe there was a Corn Belt fleet present presence on the Great Lakes. And, and perhaps, you know, one or more of those ships were involved in that plane guard duty role. Be interesting to find out. Right, right. Because there, like you said, there are so many um yard and harbor craft there were uh small coastal craft that could have been used or yeah even the larger any of the larger patrol craft as well would have served that purpose beautifully right let's see um coming back to private chat i'm going back between the comment section the private cat so um was there any training uh weapons training you know for these pilots while they were earning their uh, carrier calls I don't believe so. I believe it was purely landing and takeoffs, and uh, the weapons themselves would be handled later. Um, I, I could be wrong, but from everything that I've been able to see, it was really very focused on quals and uh, getting these pilots out the door and over to over to either coast or down to down to Pensacola to start folding them into their units. Which brings us to the next question: The war ended, and you said the carriers continued to buy to training for for a bit of time after the end of the war what was their ultimate fate and and when did that happen um i know for sure that they were decommissioned in november of 45 and then sold for scrapping in 47 and 48. Uh, i don't know which one was sold first but i believe that is that's how it ended i believe they were scrapped um and i'm sure a quick uh, Wikipedia search would probably uh, offer the answer to that, but I believe that's that's what happened. I mean, I don't, I don't know if any were kept for the purposes of trying to keep a museum ship or anything like that. I think it was purely into the scrap pile, unfortunately. That, that's okay. You know, we see that happening. Uh, well, even most recently was it the Enterprise? Mm -hmm. Can't bring it home, and it's it's going to be scrapped um, again. I understand that there's just so much naval heritage that we can preserve, but ships that have served us well, I would say deserve better. And and I know, agree. These ships were unique, and you would think that somebody would have had the foresight to turn at least one of them into a museum ship in one of the Great Lake Great Lakes ports, whether it be Chicago or, or Detroit or Buffalo. Or eerie, right, right, and what a what a testament too to the Midwest, right? The uh, that what would at that time have been the the ninth naval district of just all the really important things that they did stuck there in the middle of the country, away from either coast. Um, it would have exactly. it would have been a really nice testament to remember that by. You know, they built a ship in uh, Central Park 
for recruiting purposes during the war. Okay. Um, that didn't get preserved either. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, just as a recruiting tool to have a ship that is um, available for people far from the two coasts to see, to, to understand that the, we are a maritime nation. Um, John's got a great question about propulsion systems. Paddle wheels uh, offer particular challenges. Maintenance, uh, how reliable were the propulsion systems on these two ships? Any idea? Any uh, From everything that I've read, um, that was never an issue. Um, so I, I think that they the naval officers and um, civilians who push forward this program, uh, I, I think they, they hit the nail on the head. They were, they were right in guessing that this would work. Um, these ships had stood the test of time for decades and continued to do so during the war. Uh, it, it makes me smile though, because I can only imagine um, the sailors who had to maintain these ships had a very, very unique job in the vast Navy of World War II. Um, <laughs> you know, no one else worked on these sorts of things. so it would have been a really unique assignment uh, to be in charge of, of maintaining or uh, servicing those propulsion systems. Right. Well, as I understand, well, one, these ships have been operating for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if the Navy recruited the civilian crews to operate, especially the engineering department, um, to maintain those systems when they were pressed in the Navy service or whether the people that had been operating them as civilian uh, mariners um, were excused and Navy had a learning curve on these, were they reciprocating uh, piston steam engines that, that, that drove the shaft? That I believe so, the battle? yes. Yeah. Yes, I'm no engineer, but... <laughs> But yeah, I, I think uh, I think you're absolutely right when you say that, Fred. I think that they kept as many of the crew as they could. It's sort of um, it's sort of like how when the war first broke out and the the U boats were starting to come into the Atlantic coast, right, the Eastern Seaboard, and every civilian with a yacht was pressed into service. If you right. if you were a yacht owner or a boat owner, you could uh, put your your boat into service, and you would be automatically commissioned as a uh, I think a chief, uh, a chief boat, uh, boatswain's mate, and so um, in that sense, I think that they they probably kept a lot of the old crew. I mean, everyone was rushing to enlist anyways. What a what a convenient way to serve your country, doing a job that you're already quite good at. Great, and um, just a uh, thumbs up, kudos from uh, uh, Jim Tritton, who's uh, one of our companions and also uh, an author. Uh, um, and uh, perhaps we're going to have him as a guest speaker in one of these future months. Um, Thank you, Jim. <laughs> let's see. I don't see any more comments. I think, you know, we've covered a fascinating, you know, uh, people don't think of ships in the Great Lakes. Um, I had never thought of carriers in the Great Lakes, although I was familiar with, you know, we did some submarine chasing. There are two submarines and a combination of destroyer escorts and patrol craft escorts. They used to, you know, launch hedgehogs on occasion in the middle of Lake Michigan. Um, and uh, I recall when uh, those ships had their final cruise through the lakes and up the St. Lawrence Seaway and and down the Atlantic coast to go to their respective scrapyards. And that was, you know, that was, that was tough to, to witness. Yeah. Um, let's see one more private chat. Do you have an opportunity to obtain war stories from your grandfather? Did you have a chance? I am very, very fortunate. He, uh, he passed about a decade before I was born, but he kept everything very neatly packed uh, for the family to explore and to go through his, Marine Corps uniforms, his correspondence with Admiral Halsey, his uh, collection of photographs and photo albums and uh, souvenirs from the Japanese surrender. And so it's for the last, gosh, more, more than a decade now of my life, I've been working on trying to compile as much information as I can and sort of piece that story together as best that I can. He 
Did he keep a diary? During no diary. The, no diary. Just no di correspondence home. Yep. Yep. A lot of correspondence. A lot of a lot of photographs. So okay. mostly, yeah, mostly when he was aboard the Hornet and then cruising with the Third Fleet on the New Jersey and Missouri. Okay. Um, and I, just, I know we were back then. We were very sensitive to ensuring that nothing in our correspondence would provide too much uh, information should that correspondence not go directly to our, our intended addressees. Right. So uh, it, it must be almost like acting as a cryptologist to figure out what stories he's really telling in those. Right. It's sort of taking what's there and then moving into a uh, uh, a deck log or a war uh, diary and sort of seeing what was actually happening mm -hmm. um, that, you know, and obviously he was in the room a lot with Admiral Halsey and Admiral Carney and General Riley and all those third fleet staffers. And so his, uh, his security clearance was pretty high. <laughs> um, was he enlisted or commissioned? He was enlisted. He was a Marine corporal. Oh, I remember mean, that's uh, quite an opportunity for a, uh... A corporal to to be able to you know be a fly on the wall when no doubt some some uh, historical conversations were under being being had. Yes, yes the uh, the Battle of of Lake Gulf being the biggest one um, mm -hmm. when uh, when Halsey took the bait and raced north uh, to to be <laughs> to be in the room for that would have been something else. Oh my goodness! And, and not not such a good one. Halsey jumping on his flat hat. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so I, yeah, so I've been I've been very fortunate, and then of course uh, working for Marine Corps University and, and the press has allowed me to sort of jump back into all of these these really wonderful historical topics that I and and so many of us really enjoy. So how long have you been over at Quatico? I have been there about three years now. It was uh, July of 2019. Before that, I worked at the Historical Society of Michigan for three years in Lansing. Um, yeah. And then prior to that, I, uh, I was very lucky. I did a summer fellowship for the Marine Corps History Division when I was in grad school in my early 20s. So are you um, working on any books that, that we should be looking forward to reading? Um, I've got a great book that I just started uh, doing edits on. It's uh, We don't even have a final title yet for it, but it is on great power competition and what uh, naval arms races and naval contests during the pre-World War I period can teach uh, strategy makers and policy makers about great power competition today. Excellent. Please uh, keep us in the loop as you get closer to publication because that'd be a great topic to one both promote your book and and to to return as a guest speaker on a, a totally different topic. Absolutely. Um, I know it's serendipitous that uh, John uh, found out about you and the work you're doing and this whole idea of the carriers on, on Great Lakes. It's, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. I want to thank you for being with us this evening. Um, and I want to thank everybody who has uh, watched us live and for those of you who are going to watch this asynchronously i thank you as well um and please send your comments and your thoughts about future lectures uh, at this point we do not have a lecture yet scheduled for july um i'm not quite ready to say that we're going to give july a pass um john and i'll have a conversation about that and talk about prospective speakers uh that we might be able to get a quick turnaround for, for next month. Uh, if not, then we'll see everybody back in August with our next guest speaker. Um, and again, I want to thank everybody for their participation. Great questions coming in. A great discussion with you, Chris. Uh, fascinating work you're doing here. And I you know, uh, hope we didn't overwhelm you with homework assignment at questions to <laughs> <laughs> flesh out this story about the carriers. Right. And those of us who spend time at sea think about these things a little bit different from those who haven't mm -hmm. uh, because you know, we really, uh, it, it's fascinating how much sea space, you know, a carrier can take up, especially one, a side wheeler, and imagining how many miles it might take to, to come come around into the wind. Um, 
And I'm guessing that if you you come into the wind on Great Lakes, you can have days with 20, 30 knot winds. And if you can make, let's say, 17 knots good, that's a fair lift to get an aircraft right. off the deck, especially, you know, propeller job uh, back in those days. Again, thank you. And with that, I wish everybody a, a great evening. So long. Thank you, Fred. Thanks, everyone.